Hello, everybody. Joe Cocosa coming to you again from Divers Alert Network here in Durham, North Carolina. And I'm sitting with the Chief Medical Officer for Divers Alert Network, Dr. Nicholas Bird. Hey, Nick. How's it going? Hi, Joe. How are you? Uh, with your background, uh, you're a PADI instructor, but you were also an Air Force flight surgeon. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background uh, in the Air Force. I, uh, I joined the Air Force after uh, finishing a family medicine residency and uh, really had the great honor of be becoming an Air Force flight surgeon. And uh, part of our job at Travis Air Force Base was to work as inside attendants. So for a couple of years, I spent a lot of time working as an inside attendant and then was ultimately recruited by the hyperbarics department to be one of their staff physicians and spent my last year in the Air Force as a hyperbaric physician and ultimately liked it so much that when I got out, I uh, did a fellowship at uh, UC San Diego in hyper undersea and hyperbaric medicine. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about the stuff you did in the Air Force. You took uh, Air Force personnel up in atmospheric pressure and... Uh, brought them back down, they got bent. Uh, one of the interesting uh, aspects of being an Air Force uh, flight surgeon and a hyperbaric doc in the Air Force is that most people scratch their head and go, wait a minute, doesn't the Navy do hyperbarics? And what's the Air Force doing with hyperbarics is one of the first questions I usually get asked. And it's important to remember that decompression happens as we go from the center of the Earth out towards the edge of the atmosphere. So that same decompression is happening as we go up in altitude. One of the ways that the Air Force as systematically decompresses people is in flight training. So they put people, if you've ever seen Officer and a Gentleman or the right stuff, they'll put people into altitude chambers and have them experience hypoxia or low levels of oxygen so that they understand that, that if they have these symptoms, this might be what's going on if their aircraft depressurizes unexpectedly. So that's the purpose behind it. But that decompression causes a certain degree or incidence of decompression sickness in the air crew who are undergoing that training. And lo and behold, you need a hyperbaric chamber to treat decompression sickness, whether it's caused from ascent into altitude, just as it would be caused in an ascent uh, from deeper depths to shallower depths. So basically, you bring them up. Or ascent, rather, yeah. from deeper depths to... So you, you would bring these personnel up, they bring them back down to you know surface pressure, they get bent, then you got to bring them down. Correct. So there is a whole sequence of events that U-2 pilots, which are high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft, um, those pilots actually wear spacesuits akin to astronauts. They wear a, a just shy of a sort of a one-atmosphere suit, and they have to pre-breathe on oxygen. If you've seen the astronauts in, like, in the right stuff, and they're walking on to the space shuttle or the rocket, they're carrying these little oxygen concentrator kits, so they're breathing as much as 100% oxygen as much as possible to minimize the amount of nitrogen in their system so that when they take off, they're going up into altitude and then out to outer space, they minimize that uh, nitrogen off-gassing process as much as possible. Okay. So tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, stuff you did after you got out of the Air Force. So after completing my fellowship, I took a job as a medical director for a hyperbaric medicine department in St. George, Utah, and uh, was the medical director for uh, hyperbaric medicine there for about three years prior to coming to the diving. A lot of Olympics. diving in Utah, huh? <laughs> Not a, well, actually, you know, uh, Utah has a tremendous number of certified divers, sort of like Colorado, and there is a lot of altitude diving uh, in lakes and, and, and quarries and hot springs. I was being facetious, but... I know. Uh, but uh, they do have actually a pretty robust uh, dive training environment in that, that place. Fortunately, we didn't see uh, many divers, but saw a lot of people for other indications of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Well, when a lot of divers think about recompression chambers, they're thinking about the chamber you know, as uh, sort of a, a service for divers. But uh, recompression chambers, you're saying the business of most recompression uh, chambers is not for divers. That is correct, although historically the evolution of hyperbaric oxygen therapy came from the diving community and treating decompression sickness, it has evolved to, a, to care for people who have other illnesses other than decompression sickness. And in fact, as a result of the, of the fact that we have now understand decompression sickness much better and have developed diving practices which are so safe, 
we rarely see that much decompression sickness. So most hyperbaric departments really aren't treating much decompression sickness. They're treating all these other things um, that you like can also Like wound use management is one? Primarily, it's used as an adjunct or additional therapy for wound care and assisting uh, wounds or ena enabling wounds to heal where they weren't before. And you said also CO poisoning as well? Uh, other emergent areas, um, by emergent I mean um, emergency care, uh, where hyperbarics is used in addition to decompression sickness would be for carbon monoxide poisoning or CO poisoning. As well, uh, it gets used in some forms of severe infections, examples of which are necrotizing fasciitis and clostridial gas gangrene are two big infection areas that uh, hyperbarics gets used as uh, in addition to surgery and antibiotic care. Say that three times. <laughs> <Best>. <laughs> okay, so um, let's, let's bring this all around to, to diving. Basically, it, uh, for a diver who calls the Dan emergency line and might have a case of DCS, oh, and how that all comes together. Right. So what can you expect, in other words, uh, when you go to a hyperbaric department um, if you're needing treatment? And I think it's safe to say that uh, there are a few things that are consistent amongst all departments. Hyperbaric medicine is uh, practiced with two types of chambers. It is important for our listeners to understand that regardless of what chamber is used, the effectiveness of the therapy is the same. The first type of chamber that is most common in this country are called monoplace chambers, and they can accommodate one person at a time. What is unique about these chambers is that they are much smaller, and they are pressurized with oxygen. So the, all of the air or gas that's around that diver that they're breathing that entire time is 100% oxygen. The other variety of chamber is a multi-place, and this looks like a, maybe a small submarine, perhaps. It's a big metal tube or a box with windows on the side, and it is pressurized with air. The monoplace chamber tends to be a clear acrylic tube uh, with metal at both ends, so it's very visually open. Um, and the metal tube or box tends to be a little bit more closed, but there are usually windows. However, the effectiveness of the therapy, again, is the same. In the multi-place chamber, commonly there are other staff that will be inside that chamber with you. That might be a nurse, depending on your level of, of illness, or it might be one of the other chamber technicians that's inside the chamber uh, with you. Um, or we're, uh, we're talking a little bit before about uh, my experience in a monoplace chamber. And uh, we did have a technician there, and I did have a respiratory nurse, and she was obviously outside the chamber. But when they put me in there, the first thing I was thinking of was Apollo 1. Uh, th the, the great news about how hyperbaric medicine is practiced is that it safety is job one. And so the last thing that we ever want to have is a fire in a chamber. And so we go to great lengths to prevent that from happening. And... Fires require a fuel source, they require oxygen, and they require some ignition, some okay. sort of heat source. So Except the thing is, when you're in there, you're the fuel source. Exactly. So the last thing you want is any source of ignition. So anything that can spark, uh, ignite, or anything else is, is, is verboten. Mm -hmm. So matches, lighters. I couldn't wear my underwear because it had elastic had in it. So usually in monoplace chambers, because it's a 100% environment, you're usually in your birthday suit under a hospital gown, mm -hmm. and, and that's it. Uh, multiplace chambers, because they're pressurized with air, are a little bit more lenient. Commonly, patients are changed into a set of hospital scrubs mm -hmm. um, under which they wear their sort of normal underclothes, but just a ho pair of hospital scrubs. But usually, yes, jewelry, makeup, uh, alcohol, hairsprays, uh, well, you see, I don't have to worry about hairspray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes things easy. <laughs> so any other, uh, basically any other war stories from chambers that you can relate? Uh, one can anticipate when they go into a hyperbaric chamber that the worst thing that's really going to happen to you is they're going to bore you to tears. Uh, if you get treated f as a diver with decompression sickness, it's usually about a five to six hour treatment. And it may have to be repeated depending upon how effective the first one is. Mm -hmm. So if you're lucky and it's got a, you got a minor hit and you might get complete resolution and, and that might be it, uh, you might require subsequent treatments as well. Well, if you're really lucky, you get a really hot respiratory nurse. I will say that the professionalism of uh, most hyperbaric uh, staff is exceptional 
and they work extremely diligently at uh, educating themselves and raising the bar of their educational level on a consistent basis. If some of those happen to be visually appealing to some of those of, of our patients, then that would be a, an extra prize for the same low price. Well, I can definitely recommend the uh, staff at the ga hospital in Gainesville, but um, uh, Nick, thanks so much for uh, giving us the sort of the inside dope on hyperbaric chamber operations and stuff like that, and uh, hopefully no one will actually need the n to this information, but it's always good to have it out there. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more.